<laughs> all right. So we are going to our panel on computing for human experience. And here are the panelists. May I start? Uh, hello, everyone. We are going to be discussing computing for human experience today. Um, the panel discussion will be uh, done by Ranjit, Vishal, myself, Vedant, Vipula, Chaturangi, and Rakshit. <clears throat> so the outline is as follows for the audience. Um, just a brief introduction on the semantics empowered sensors, services, social computing on ubiquitous web. We'll not talk a lot about this for now. Um, then we'll be bridging the physical and digital divide. Chaturangi will take up and lead that discussion. Following which we will um, talk about elevating abstractions that machines understand, uh, which will take which will be taken by Ranjit. Then I will talk about perception to semantics, the bridging the gap between them. Then Vishal will talk about semantics at, a, at an extraordinary scale. Semantic computing as a starting point will be led by Vipula. And finally, Vedant and Rakshit will uh, talk to us about influential and, and interesting works that lead to computing for human experience. All right, so semantics empowered sensors, services, and social computing on ubiquitous web. You're not in okay, so and the key enablers of uh, CHE are, um, as we said, so the first part is going to be bridging the physical versus digital divide, uh, a cyber divide. So basically that en en encompasses the human computer interaction, following which when we want to talk about uh, levels of abstraction and background knowledge, which is something that is close to all of our heart, we have extensive discussions on this. Um, and from that, basically we want to talk about how to go from signal to perceptions. After going from signal to perceptions, can we convert the raw data and observations um, through these sensory inputs? and convert them into semantic symbolic representation that can be meaningful to us. Finally, we want to scale it and, um, and just try and see if we can uh, connect the web and humanity uh, for, for this aspect. Uh, I will let Chaturangi take over now to talk to us about bridging the physical and digital cyber divide. Do you? I can, I can. Just let me know. Okay. Yeah, the first key enabler of CHG is uh, bridging the physical and the digital divide. Uh, that means we have two worlds, like the physical world where we are all involved in, and the digital world involves the cyber or the hardware and the software components that we have to deal with. So we have already seen significant influence uh, that computing devices uh, help us and support humans. Uh, so we have, as humans, uh, we have been uh, living in this continuous journey for decades, uh, that decades with the computing devices uh, and the computing devices help us ease our day-to-day -day life activities. And this uh, has led us to a state which is known as human machine uh, symbiotic relationships. Uh, so uh, from the invention of the computing devices to, to the invention of the GUIs, uh, uh, to the invention of the mobile phones, and then the smart invention of the iPhones, uh, the, and then to the intelligent interfaces, uh, which are exemplified by the Tom Gruber's intelligent interfacing devices. So we have already seen these inventions in the past. And then uh, there comes an era where the machines that uh, came that can understand and sense uh, human mind, body, and place, which we uh, saw in the uh, mind lamp like inventions. And then the then prototype prototype like inventions came uh, that uh, help and help humans uh, with uh, that means the computers that can interpret the world around us and they provided us with relevant information in real time, which we uh, saw in prototype like applications like the MIT Six Sense project. And then uh, there, uh, and then extended discussion were uh, led uh, on how to use human in the loop sensing. That means how humans can 
support the decision making and how they can involve with working with the machines. So that means uh, human feedback, human knowledge and linguistics and feedbacks can be used uh, to uh, make this human computer interaction more interactive and more useful for human beings. So uh, as uh, Dr. Shet has uh, explained in his keynote and has written in this pa paper also, uh, the real world events, when we talk about the real world events, uh, the building blocks of real world events come from the keywords and then come patterns from the objects to the real world events. So all these events in the physical environment or the physical world should have a particular responsive uh, counterpart in the cyber world. That's one of the main uh, concept that CHE is dealing with. So uh, I came up with this interesting phrase, uh, like uh, first we build the tools and then they build us, which is phrased by the Canadian philosopher, Marshall McCoon. Uh, that means as humans uh, in earlier ages, earlier years, we built the, the computing devices and then uh, we interacted and make our tasks easier uh, through these machines. And then uh, they build, build their, then the machines build their own intelligence artificially and then they help to build ourselves as humans. Uh, so a recent uh, example of this is can be taken as the Microsoft Copilot systems, uh, which helped uh, the, which includes the computers that help humans to think, plan, and act accordingly. So uh, some of the recent examples we can say as robots, which uh, help and supports humans in their day-to-day -day life activities. And also uh, there is extensive uh, 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 possibility that we can use uh, virtual reality in like uh, systems uh, like education and healthcare. And also we can use AI to augment human decision making. So all these uh, instances help us uh, to make the human and computing interaction more powerful. And also some future like applications we can think of like as uh, mind uploading, muscle memory and machines with biological brains. These are all concepts that not yet have been uh, developed, but they can help uh, to build more, uh, build the interaction between the human and the computing more uh, powerful. So after all these things are done, we can enter into a state called uh, the man-machine coexistence, where the machines and ma uh, the humans work together and continue with their goals and objectives. So uh, if I talk about some, yeah, next slide. Uh, do you just want to pass this laptop? No. Yeah, that's yeah, just hold, I mean, you can close yours and just yeah. take. So uh, these are some of the discussion questions. I thought uh, this uh, topic would lead into. Uh, so you can uh, jump and uh, enter your uh, talk with your ideas and uh, critics and ideas. So uh, the first question is, in what ways do you think that the technology can be used to enhance the collective human capabilities? So here, the collective human capabilities, what I mean is that uh, the collective learning and the collective uh, decision making and collective uh, the self-learning abilities and also the things which we humans can do as a group very well. That means not alone. That means if you think about situations like uh, making correct decisions, uh, we can say that uh, if we all help, all uh, got together and uh, sit in like a group and make decisions, then the ultimate decision and the, the output would be more powerful than making individual decisions. So how does the technology would help us to in this to enhance the collective human capabilities? So I thought. Yeah, attention. attention to the fact that uh, you pay attention to the fact that today, much of the AI, emphasis on the AI, at least the popular discussion, is all centered around starting with all the words that people have written. Everything is on the web. 
and Do trying to make sense here? out of it. That is um, completely discounting the kind of activities where humans and uh, machines are collaborating. Human and human are collaborating. And uh, human and machines are collaborating, for example, in the virtual reality uh, context, human and machines are uh, uh, you know, sort of interacting to augmented reality work. Um, and um, humans are kind of, you know, talking, talking to each other and pointing to each other on social media. So much, so much, you know, uh, there are all the IOTs that are observing what is what humans are doing. All of these are currently being ignored in the AI that we have, you know, in, in, in this all focus on language models. All of that is being ignored. I can bet and just count that in another five years or so, the pendulum will uh, shift and that people will realize that learning from uh, all of that data there is only a small part of the um, things that you want to work with, that you want to learn from, that you want to use. You want to incorporate dynamic online in real time interaction between humans and humans and machines. So keep that in mind as we, uh, you know, uh, and not get sucked up only in what is happening today with this personal language models. Okay. Yeah, uh, so what I uh, suggest is that we can use uh, tools like online collaboration tools and social media and cloud computing and the AR and VR applications like uh, to enhance the collective human capabilities and make use of it. And then the second question is, uh, what ethical concerns should we consider when it comes to uh, bridging the physical and the digital device? and how can we ensure that technology is being used for the greater good? So uh, one of the uh, major, this is one of the major concern that we need to deal with when we uh, work with these computing devices and the technologies, that is, uh, there should be some measures to uh, secure our data. And also we should be considered about the privacy and the security and how we should have control of these technologies uh, when we are working with and uh, things like that. And also the third question is... Uh, here, here I'd like to make a point that this question basically, the ethical concerns is what we were talking about today and we have had continued discussions about ethics, safety, so on and so mm -hmm. forth. And basically the question boils down to who is going to be responsible yeah, yeah. for um, the good or the bad, not, not just the problems that it can cause, but also who is who's going to take credit for the good that it does, right? So, and, and this is something that we have already discussed before, right? Some very concrete measures need to be put in place to ensure to somehow restrict or control um, that that uh, processing. So, so I, I think it's a really good point, Vega, but it is a different point. Mm -hmm. And I ask, I would like to ask you guys, do you have the skills and the knowledge to decide what constitutes the greater good? Uh, probably not. Probably not. Probably not. But but the question that Mega raises is is one where you could conceivably provide some value added to the debate in identifying who made what changes to the code, the, the biases in the algorithms, et cetera. At this point, um, I'd like to say that the greater good is a very subjective term. Even as human beings, none of us are, uh, you know, the ideal people, none of us bind, bind, abide to the codes and the rules and regulations that we're supposed to. So we cannot really expect a machine to do it. I <laughs> think the more appropriate I mean, yeah, the word that I am. It's yeah. not parallel. I want wisdom, not uh, facts. <laughs> <laughs> I guess the more appropriate word is socially acceptable. Like, what is more? Uh, That's going to be a cultural issue, right? Yeah. What is is acceptable and for the sure. greater good is different 
in, I don't know what, Russia than it is in China, than it is in the United States, et cetera. So I, I, I worry about you bringing to bear your expertise on what you know. I think we need to have some, we need to define what is good and what is bad in order to have a sound judgment. Like a do constitution you, do that- you, did, yeah. did the inventor of the atom bomb worry about that? I think after it dropped. It. <laughs> okay, but, but what was the job? Right. And what is your job? I guess is the is the have question. a constitution in place. Like we have a constitution that uh, that is a set of rules and regulations for so us human beings. EU, European Union has an AI law that is passed mm -hmm. out in probably two thousand. But that still law does not ensure a check on it. It's yeah. a post fact. Yeah. Uh, no, okay, so let, yeah, let, yeah, let, let me put my, you know, critical statement and, you know, you, I want to oh, stop. Okay, so two pieces of story. There is no question we need to learn from sensors and you know, physical devices, etc. No question. No, mm -hmm. not absolutely. So two parts of the story. Part of the story is we need to learn from those devices and it to be incorporated. And second is the ubiquitous computing issues. Two part of the story, computing issue and, the, you know, learn. So learning is happening. There are multiple systems. The best example for the Google, right? The Google map learned from the sensors and etc. And very, you know, you know, great way, you know, multi, you know, you know, you know, adjust a lot of things and it, it, it works. But this ubiquitous computing, I mean, yeah, it's it's a dream for computer, you know, scientists for a long time. I mean, I don't think. I mean, this is my view and many others' views are also I've seen on social media. Nobody believes in metaverse other than Google. Earth. He probably played a lot of games in his you know, school days, and he's very fond about you know putting this you know headset and you know doing you know, all <laughs> it's, it's not possible. It's all, all you know absolutely not possible. So what do you think would be the ubiquitous computing? You know, is it uh, you know the you know product mysteries uh, ubiquitous computing kind of thing? What are you talking about? But still, the social media we do in on mobile, all laptops, right? So ubiquitous computing. I don't I don't know. I would like to hear from you know parents. Uh, while we are heading. Now, one negative example I have seen through my life and experience. Okay, so I was a, a kind of, a, a, you know, advisory member to Smart City Project in India. And uh, for that, you know, the three body portal was a smart city. And I traveled to IBM, uh, you know, uh, Ireland. They, they opened up a smart city, you know, center, research center, and which gone abolished now. So this smart city idea that we'll be learning for sensor, this and that is, Indeed, was an idea, but it's not working. People don't see much research ideas coming yeah. out, research papers. So it, it happens around 16 to 18, two or three. A lot of papers came out even from IBM and etc. But then it got vanished. So is it a ubiquitous computing problem or what else? How do you see this? Yeah, sorry. So yeah. Dr. Das, uh, regarding ubiquitous computing, hmm. uh, I'm honestly not sure because starting from Pranus, it's the idea that he put over the mm -hmm. system was done way back in MIT. It was started by somebody else. Mm -hmm. They start in probably 1970 mm -hmm. and they started building really viable people. Mm -hmm. Your problem is himself is not working on that. Yeah, he himself now really generous. He was offered yeah. Samsung, so he quit his PhD right. at MIT right. midway and right. just joined Samsung as a vice president. Right. And now he quit Samsung as well. Oh, he quit Samsung. He quit Samsung as well. Right. And he is having his own startup. Okay. So that was probably the genesis of what could possibly have been the next form of computing. Mm -hmm. And metaverse, as you said, that was just in the keynote that they talked about, but we see only LLMs being dropped out of face the meta company every year. So I'm not very sure what they're doing when it comes to uh, the VR headsets or Oculus and so on. So currently, when we look at it, it's all LLMs, at least the advertising that we see of or, there. Or foundation models. Or foundation models. models. Yes. Yeah. So it's all about that. Even though like the advertisement from OpenAI and Microsoft is so strong that Palm beats GPT-4 in most of the benchmarks, mm -hmm. but even then we just talk about GPT-4, mm -hmm. even though there are like no empirical results from whatever report they have given. So, so by ubiquitous, you, you mean multimodal, is that what you're saying? What do you, what do you mean by, because there's another reading of ubiquitous, which is, has to do with the accessibility and mm -hmm. availability yes. of all exactly. of this right. for everybody right. else. So what, what are you guys saying? Yeah, that's, <laughs> experts? That's the question. <laughs> 
so for uh, so I, I have uh, like different thoughts so for uh, so if when we talk about social media right so uh, what kind of privacy that we are looking for in, in social media because social media is meant for to just uh, share. Uh, share share right so are we like talking about our uh, what pers like yeah. personal information yeah. there the confidential data should be protected like uh, the our demographic data like age Why? And, uh, yes <laughs> but but even if you do so even if you protect the me metadata of the user themselves you will have no control over the user themselves what information they choose to yeah. share that will always be out there yeah. mm. no like this reminds me of a funny story so we created a chatbot last semester and what we did Leaving chatbot, what we did was we went to a government FAQ website, scraped the FAQ data that the government already has put out, and we just created a chat interface on top of that. And we were just testing out this interface because we wanted to see if people, if there is technology, people would adopt it more. Either early teenagers who just got their voting rights or people who are already old who cannot like get the uh, information by going to the place in person. Uh, so we were testing it in Mississippi and South Carolina, which are two of the tough states to vote. And I was uh, doing the trials for Mississippi and there was one person who said, uh, so how do I trust your information? We said, this is what we are doing. It's directly coming from the government website. But he said, you're handling the data right at the end of the day. You can tell me whatever story you want on how you are building. But how do I believe that you did not put your own information in? Mm -hmm. So trust, I think, is very varied based on person to person on the topmost level we can say this is what trustworthiness might look like as researchers but my mom still considers facebook as unethical and looking at five screens a day as unethical yes. <laughs> they believe it to be true. oh that, that is the trend now but way back when it just started right so being on like logging into facebook was unethical in my home <laughs> so they found some software to just block it. Now, when she saw about this Oculus, uh, she, the Oculus that was being put out by Meta, she was like, when I was small, I was advised not to watch the screen from, from a certain distance. Now, screen is like sitting right on the <laughs> So how is this ethical? I, I think it's just adapting to the change. At some point, we just accept that, okay, take my PAN card, passport number, everything is ethical. You can do whatever you want with it. it, it I think it's at the end of the day, it's the trade-off that we are willing to consider. The trade-off between, let's say, some sort of personalization in the ads that we are receiving or the search results that we get at the end of the day. Yeah, I'm willing to save my credit. So, sorry. What's your role in this? You know, as computer scientist? Yeah, as computer scientist, because that's what you're getting a degree in. You're not getting a degree in social science. You're not getting a degree in ethics. You're not getting a degree in anthropology. You're not getting that kind of degree. So what are you going to do? So and how does your expertise, experts, fare? <laughs> on so I think from my point of view, there will always be some sort of privacy and uh, security concerns with the data that is being shared. So one simple, maybe not simple, but one possible solution that can at least uh, give uh, the user, the end user, an understanding of what is being shared, what is being happening, is the transparency. The transparency of data being used. Okay. The transparency of how uh, uh, every single it is. So that's where we come in. So whatever we create but can be... Have this time to read three pages. Like, no, 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 no. Three pages long of transparency. Nobody is going to read. Nobody, nobody reads. Nobody reads. That, is, that is exactly the point that I was it's, going it's, to make. So thank you, Vedant, for the preload. That is where all of our so work that's not on. The main point. <laughs> the first part of the story, now the second. That is where all of our work on explainability and transparency, all of that comes in. So I, I get to teach at the startup, which now you know I haven't done it. So idea was, you know, the way you know, Facebook created this array where Google mm -hmm. Glasses, you can yeah. so, so the Google Glasses Google kind of Google. Google. So I mean, this is probably last year, but I am talking about this startup at least four years back. Okay. okay? So the idea is, you know, Bangalore, you know, in, in mm -hmm. India. So it's a kind of migrant city, right? Right. Nobody is, you know, native Bangalorean. Yeah. 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 Come from different part of the country right. and uh, stay there. Mostly so, like the IT hub. Yeah. 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 And you are living in a neighborhood where nobody knows each other. Mm -hmm. okay? So they created this, this class 
and you just walk out and the idea was everybody will subscribe to this is a kind of you know virtual social media oh. and you just walk around and say oh this is a Pedan, you can be a student and he was oh, and my just doing everything mixed in oh. and this is Pedan, oh okay he's a first year student you know so very enthusiastic about this so much information I talk to that uh, you know that guy and he will become more social and so on it's just that there is no way to find that you are doing. But it's a, it's a fascinating idea, right? And if you can do it, I mean, if more people actually is concerned with this, you have more data. So you can write for more things. I say it's good. But that did not fly. But see, it doesn't mean that Google Glass did not fly, virtual reality did not fly today. I mean, maybe society is not that mature, etc. Those questions are there. But my is what is the what is the role of same question what can be asked right? What is the role of computer science people to bring <laughs> ubiquitous computing in the reality? Until only it is in reality. Uh, okay. yeah. At least at this stage, I don't think we as early PhD people at <laughs> least yeah. do not know what laws we are breaking when we are creating an AI system. So it should probably involve much more people than just computer scientists talking about yeah. the world. I, I don't think, um, to put it bluntly, I, I don't think it's your business. Right. <laughs> I was about to say that, but. Uh. As computer, and I, to put an end to this particular line of discussion and moving on, I would, I would, I would, I would say that, that uh, yeah, I would say that even if there are no, uh, laws in place or security checks in place as computer scientists as people who are trying to build smarter machines we should keep these things in our mind at least for now and later look at how we can make whatever checks we have kept in place in our machines guys, to make, uh, make it accessible. If you're talking about this issue this long clearly we are taking time. So <laughs> yeah so let's let's move our on. Audience also we need to not you know okay <laughs> there's so much other <laughs> You know, yeah, that's important thing to discuss that uh, you know every right. time is going about uh, trust and uh, ethics yep. is just waste of time. Yeah. So I guess the we can... third question I decided is how can we ensure that bridging the physical and digital divide does not further widen the social economic gap and in what ways can technology be used to promote social and economic equality? Mm -hmm. So, uh, so in earlier where the computer devices came, uh, not many, much people used computing devices, but today we almost, almost all the people have a mobile phone, at least a mobile phone in their hand. So the now technology is everywhere and we are almost, everyone is using it and we don't realize actually that we are living with this technology now, uh, but uh, there can be certain groups of people and who are being excluded or marginalized from this technology. I mean, uh, the technology can be somewhat biased and there can be accessible issues. And for some people, the technology cannot, uh, may not be affordable. Uh, so uh, we as a computer scientist, a scientist, I uh, think that uh, we should use this technology such that uh, it promotes the social and economic equality and not uh, certain groups in a way that not certain groups are excluded or marginalized. And also one thing that pop up to my mind is that uh, there are some kind of disability people in this world. So uh, there, some of the technologies that recent technologies may not be accessible by them, but uh, we should have measures or some other ways or other modes in uh, which uh, we can we can make these people also use uh, these uh, particular technologies. Uh, so that's why I thought. And also the fourth question is also similar to the third one, like uh, how we can ensure that uh, the benefits of pigeon divide remains accessible to everyone. So the answer is that we, it's the same as earlier that we should ensure that the technology is accessible to each and every people. So finally, uh, I should, uh, the final question is that, uh, would this bridge serve as an invitation to technological singularity? And I would like to uh, hear your thoughts on that. Uh, so that technological singularity means that uh, here we see that the computing devices, the technology are 
uh, becoming more advanced day by day. Uh, so there, at one point, there can be a situation like that the technology surpasses human beings. So uh, will this digital divide or this uh, will this begin the digital, digital divide concept led to the technological singularity? So what do you guys think? So I would like to uh, say two points first on the third and fourth question. I think that is a very uh, important point that you just mentioned the idea of accessibility. And this is one thing uh, which you see a lot in the day to day life. Let's say some website or there is some uh, printed paper can or some uh, exact device. Can it be used uh, at the same time by a person with uh, who is visibly uh, disabled or a person who can uh, see uh, very clearly? So I think uh, from my point of view, uh, there will at least at some extent you'll always have one or the other certain group. They might be minor groups, might not be the major groups who might not have access to this device. But to some level, we should uh, consider and should. Uh, I think there is already a lot of st research starting in the field of human in the loop mm -hmm. being uh, with uh, all these AI systems. So that is one way of uh, increasing or at least uh, a better way of addressing the issue of accessibility. And uh, the second, uh, so this is just quickly uh, like referring to the book review which I did, I did Noah scene. So the author Lovelock, uh, he mentioned that uh, based on his understanding that AI, uh, the, the way in which AI is evolving and uh, there are uh, some recent uh, papers, maybe Vishal can add more on this by Google, where this, uh, where they are just using uh, transformers, or large language models uh, on the back end of robots, like just plain uh, uh, transformers, like the large language models which they have. There is no other tweaking on that. And the robots are able to perform certain tasks. So I think uh, based on what uh, that book uh, said, the author said that, yes, uh, at some point of time, we will reach to this uh, idea of technological singularity where the where there will be living cyborgs and the entire biosphere won't just consist of uh, us humans, but it will be both humans and technology uh, surviving, trying to survive. Yeah, but, uh, the technological singularity, that concept is... Uh... It's not like uh, coexisting human and machine. The singularity concept, it talks about something like that. Uh, the machines are more powerful than humans so that the machines have more power and control in their hands so that the machines control ourselves, humans. Did anybody need to put us in there? Forward, forward. Yeah, forward, forward. Yeah, forward, forward. Yeah, so his, his, his you know, idea is is you know backward propagation is yeah no, no, no. <laughs> no I mean, I, 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 that should change no 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 it's it's high, highly computer computing intensive obviously we have a better method too and he has a proposal mm -hmm. so, that that yeah. might be hitting us but so, oh. so guys first of all you need to keep in mind that this was written in 2008 okay secondly so far, I really didn't get any, you know, I, you guys did not say what is computing for human experience. What is the whole premise of this paper? I guess just, I just only present it all other texts. Huh? Yeah. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. 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 This is just this the start, Doctor. You yeah. got five or something. This is just a start. The uh, no, first copy that people will present. Okay. But I mean, the whole. Uh, uh, the context in which this work was written mm -hmm. is something that's the critical. Oh, you, you want to... So that will, I think, come uh, in the last you know, part. You should be starting with that. That's what mm -hmm. you know. You should first say, if, you know, uh, you're talking about this world, this this particular aspects of the things. Mm -hmm. The whole. Uh, we can start with the, the yeah, part. Part. So, so first, okay. uh, it's like you have a panel on something. What is the topic about? Really, you don't. You know, in fact, you should have put the first page itself. A link to the original thing. You know, we are video recording it. Somebody comes uh, to see your, they don't know what the are talking about. What is the reference point? Right? Anyway, yeah. uh, it, we, I think I, I hear too many uh, non uh, you know, related things uh, that you, um, okay, these are all, you know, warm and fuzzy things like ethics and other things. No, get, get to the point here. You know, what is the human experience and, you know, uh, 
in the context of um, uh, all the other you know important visions that were presented ahead of this did this bring anything new did this combine things whatever that is it has to come in picture Okay. Should we continue with the floor? Do you want to go first? Can you just talk about the semantic and the yeah. yeah. You can just man maneuver to your slide and talk about it. Yes. The main crux of the paper is this. This and this I'm is asking you to really think about why. Uh, part first before you go into any of those uh, you know what and how so the main topic for this panel discussion is computing for human experience it is CHA and the main idea is do you want to open the paper no 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 the it is like Sean. Yeah. Yes. So the term semantic computing, it was coined in this paper, which was in 2010, 2011 time period. The question is architecture as well, and that is the description of this architecture. Uh, so it talks about the four key components, data or resources. So you can see uh, three blocks, and then there are uh, graph kind of structures on the left. No, they are knowledge graphs. There's the thing, there's ontologies. There's yeah. graph structures. These are basically ontologies. Yeah. So we have data resources, models and knowledge, semantic annotation, semantic analysis or reasoning. So these are the four key components. So if you look at the lower uh, block, those are the different data resources. And the data can be in the form of structure, semi-structure, different kinds of text, multimedia content, sensor data. I think I even came across one line which talks about multimodal data. I don't know how much uh, it was uh, uh, upcoming at that point, but there is one mention of multimodal and sensor data too. So these are the different uh, kinds or uh, sources of data. Then on the left, we have conceptual models and background knowledge, which are those uh, orange, green, uh, gray color graphs, which are ontology. Then we have semantic annotation. So basically, in the, in the paper, it says that uh, the mention of metadata, um, those are the semantic, like there is metadata and then there are semantic annotation, which are taken from the ontologies. And finally, there is semantic analysis and reasoning. So this can be used in the search uh, knowledge discovery. And at that time, which was quite uh, prevalent, and then it goes into the World Wide Web too. And basically, uh, I don't know. So this was before the uh, paper on semantic web, right? Or no, it was after the paper on semantic hmm. in 2001. Hmm. So basically, this is the part of the paper. And then there is an example uh, about agriculture domain, which somebody is going to talk about later. But then I just found this quick article also, uh, where the use case is healthcare. And what it basically says is, so there is Joanna and Maria, who happen to be sisters. Uh, and it's just one article uh, which was there in 2016, and it talks about semantic computing as a use case in healthcare. So say one of the sisters, Joanne, visits doctor and she has some symptoms and she is diagnosed with uh, breast cancer. Now, if Maria visits the same doctor and if they have, obviously they are going to have a common mother, and if the uh, symptoms are somehow stored in some kind of database, then how is it going to know that Maria might show similar symptoms? So if there is some kind of ontology or schema that's going to say that, hey, they are actually related with this sister relationship, 
then maybe there could be some additional help in saying that she she might have some similar symptoms. So this was a quick uh, example uh, they have mentioned uh, in in that uh, blog post or it's just an article, and it talks about how so it, it was around the time when this term was coming up, like precision medicine, and even personalization, and that is where such things can contribute to a greater extent as opposed to having just database and no knowledge of what the relationships actually exist uh, between these two humans or these two entities. Um, yeah. So expert, is it fair to say then that semantic computing is about having the propositional no. content? Associated with it would be one part of it. So, uh, can I take take this uh, discussion to the next level? So, basically, there is a similar point in the the influential and interesting. So, can you go back to the slide, uh, slide number fifteen? So, where uh, so so whenever Bush uh, so the article published in nineteen forty five, uh, and uh, uh, the article uh, published in nineteen ninety four uh, uh, about the MRF link. So. In 1945, uh, whenever Bush uh, uh, talks about uh, 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 information retrieval things, so like uh, for example, a different data set linked with together and then uh, index the data, so information retrieval can be better and those kind of things like relationship between the data set. And then uh, in 1994, uh, so there is article Dr. Shet and I think Ramakrishnan or or, or someone uh, in in this particular article. So where uh, uh, they have mentioned uh, to link uh, different page, like the web pages. Uh, so if you talk about the metadata, so this is the metadata reference. Uh, so so consider like uh, the entire all all the web pages uh, are linked with each other. For example, if we have uh, uh, the web pages uh, with RDF uh, framework, right? So not the XML thing. So I think currently uh, uh, they are uh, using the XML uh, structure, but uh, once we have, let's say, RDF thing, and then all the resources are linked with each other, then uh, think about the search, like what will be the uh, so So currently uh, we can see like the Google search and the different thing, right? So. So, so this is the vision. I think it is. Uh, I think you talked about in 1994 in this particular article. Yeah, right. Uh, MRF was introduced in 1994. Mm -hmm. Sorry, 1996, uh, and the RDF version of MRF was 1998. Uh, so, sorry, please go ahead. And, uh, You're the expert. So, <laughs> so just to uh, give a brief overview of how uh, this like like the diagram is there. So if you see at the heart of this diagram, we have CHE that is computing for human experience. Now, when you say human experience uh, and you see computing, what all uh, do you consider in human experience? Your a human experience will be better if your needs are met. A human ex experience would be better if your values are met. A human experience would be better if you are if uh, it is more engaging. A human experience would be better if the information that you want to retrieve is faster and the quality of information is high. And uh, information uh, the experience would be better if the computing interface is better. So all these different visions which are published from uh, 1945 to 2008 consists of these different point of views. Of human experience, and that's why you have uh, computing for uh, computing for human experience at the heart of the diagram, and all the other things around it. Because at the at the end, the main focus of every single vision was human experience, but they differ in these different things. So Rakshit just mentioned about the personal information and storage retrieval, memics, uh, extension of that particular vision. So Memex was never implemented. Even now it's it's not implemented like the exact Memex system. But an extension of that was the project by uh, Microsoft, uh, which was in 2002, My Life Bits. So the the whole idea of uh, My Life Bits was, uh, if I want to explain in very simple terms, is life blogging. Uh, sorry, life logging. So how you see Google Photos, 
Google Photos you have, it has all your photos and, and the memories. It will show you that four years ago, these things were there. So that was the, that was more or less the idea of uh, that my life, but where you store personal memories and uh, retrieve them. Mm -hmm. Further, uh, when we come to the idea of uh, humanist computing and experiential computing, which was both uh, released, uh, which was both uh, ideated in 2003. Now, both of these ideas are very similar. What both considers is that whatever technology you build or uh, whatever uh, AI system you're trying to build should have humans at the heart of it. That it should consider uh, before solving any technical aspect of it, it should consider humans. But the way it differs is, uh, now again, here we will be talking about another two aspects of human experience. So humanist com uh, computing mentions, so it was given by Jay Rossiter, and in 2003, he mentioned that the technology will be uh, should be human-centered, and it should be developed by keeping human values and needs at the center of it. Whereas the experiential uh, computing by uh, Ramesh Jain was all about the engagement, the kind of experience, like uh, consider in today's date something close to it is VR. So VR is something that uh, gives you more experience. Now, let's say I like horror movies more. So maybe if I am playing a VR game and it has ML model uh, inside it, so if it personalizes and gives me more uh, jump scares during the game or more horror content, I'll be more engaged. That's the kind of thing is uh, what is explained by experiential computing. And then uh, I think uh, Rakshat can talk more about MVR. Yeah, so for uh, intelligent user, so, so one point is intelligent user interface, right? So, uh, uh, so, so that is one aspect uh, of uh, CHE. Uh, so apart from uh, a different AI technology and a different angle to CHE, uh, user experience is uh, also uh, uh, the angle uh, for CHE. And uh, so the simple example, if we talk about uh, for intelligent user interface, uh, so I can think of uh, a remote control. So you can see the remote control from Samsung and you can see the remote control from Apple, uh, Apple TV or something, right? So very simple and uh, uh, so like there are not uh, many switch and uh, so it, it's very easy to be, yeah yeah so yeah so these are the different angles uh, for the CHE. so you, you guys have a very uh, this is extremely helpful for me because I've, mm -hmm. I've had a hard time understanding what the disconnect is between the way you guys are thinking and the way i think you have a very different idea about the role of computers in our lives than i have I want computers to eliminate all of the drudgery. I have a mechanical notion of what a, a, a machine should do for me. So I, I don't want to fill out expense reports, <laughs> for example. There's a whole lot of things that I don't want to do that I would like computers to do for me. I'm not looking for entertainment. I think that entertainment might have a marketing value, but I'm looking for something completely different. I'm looking for a computer to take over um, the building tasks that that uh, people in hospitals need to perform, uh, the drudgery stuff. So what what you are talking about is all about the use cases. Yeah. So this physical, not physically, but mentally labor intensive. Yes. Yeah. So uh, I'll. It's very important for you to understand the distinction. These are all, you know, recognized as things that came before CHG. What is so unique? What is different and new about CHE? And Rotisser talked about the value and other things. Mm -hmm. uh, Ramesh talked about the experience yes. and in entertainment, games, other things. Right. The thing you need to understand is that uh, the competing for human experience is more along the line of where um, uh, Valerie is going, saying that uh, computers are subservient. And the technology with that AI or whatever that is, the, the year for semantic, but in a semantic computing has uh, gone into AI, NLP has gone into AI. There, there, there's multiple uh, strands that have come to current AI. Um, and so he understand the real distinction between the farmer example given here mm -hmm. 
and what is done by the technology on behalf of the farmer, computation technology on behalf of the farmer, versus all of the examples others have given. Okay, mm -hmm. and see that that is where you understand the difference. There is no reason for me to write a paper on something which anyway is a subset of what all is already been talked about, right? So what is important is for you to be able to understand the depth and comprehensiveness of that example and what that does for human vis-a-vis -vis the example that people have given for my life bits, example people have given for um, uh, you know, uh, UVCOM, example people have given for ambient intelligence. There is a uh, difference in broad variety of things, for example, the variety of data that is incorporated. Variety of ways all that data is brought together contextually to serve the purpose that human serve, serve the human. Okay. That part is the important part. And, and then that architecture you saw is uh, that you know in that era, the most That those three graphs that are that you see there, that's the world model. Mm -hmm. That is the you know uh, so uh, and then you create the metadata so that the, the data operation modality. Here is a person uh, you know John Smith. This is John Smith as in text and a set, you know paragraph about John Smith. This is John Smith in photograph. This is a video of John Smith. This is the uh, John Smith being monitored, right? And they come together. They are the same person in in creating a graph formalism is shown there. As a more uh, richer formalism uh, of for annotation, and those annotations are semantic because you have those, uh, you know, reference points in the okay. model. Mm -hmm. And then you go to the thing it says pattern recognition to reasoning. Mm -hmm. What is that, right? So okay. it covers right. the thing. Uh, currently, still the genetic model is all pattern centric, right? Reason is very important. So neuro symbolic AI that we are talking about is co combining the two, and then. Practically shows broad variety of applications that are known to the people then at that time, and that's why those are the ones that are shown to show that all of those uh, you know can be supported through that you know you know the search system can be supported as well as some all of those more advanced applications can be supported. Situational awareness, right? Some of the thing, right? More comprehensive thing like humans are uh, you are you are in a very heavy rain. And you are choosing to make the stuff. You are you are in a, you know facing a tornado. You are making you know your choices, and you know so you are aware of all things happening, and all the physical things, all of the uh, you know you you, know, you to protect your child, and then you are making choices and decisions. Right. So those are the things that are. So doctor said. Uh, so in the in the in that particular graph, right? Or uh, we, we can we can discuss about the Wikipedia as well. So all these different open source knowledge graph. Are uh, based on the one source, but uh, so no, but that that, that yeah, this one clearly shows uh, you know and, and talks about not one source, one so multiple sources, yeah. And, and in fact, there is I don't know what did I say there, but essentially, if you think about it, I mean we are all focused on uh, getting things done in computer, but mm -hmm. computers are never going to be uh, alive, right? You know, they are not rooted in the reality. They are not breathing. They are not having uh, the uh, religion, the culture, the you know biases, uh, all, all the things that you have. Mm. They are not having all the senses. They are not having all the emotions. Right. Right. I mean, I, I, uh, you know, the same data that is fed to me and that is fed to you will both come up with the different uh, choices to, you know, in terms of processing of those data. Right, and and where is that? Where, where is that reflected? You know, we have individualities, we have personalities, we have uniqueness. Where is that reflected? Right, you you know, uh, you today type in a, something in ChatGPT, and then you know he types in the ChatGPT, same question at the same time, they are giving same results, hopefully, mm -hmm. <laughs> but deterministic. But uh, you are in exactly the same situation in the real world. You know, for example, having to, uh, you know, uh, you know, make a decision about your loved one, and he is doing the same, and you are coming to different decisions. Dr. Shit, uh, 
as far as I think we have all seen that when you put that context in chat GPT, it is able to give those uh, different answers. Okay. Right. Uh, we, we have all seen uh, several different different examples of that. So even if the question is more or less the same, but if you just put in, if you have had a previous conversation with chat GPT on that particular topic, it retains, yeah. it retains that particular information. It, it, it has that flow of thought. But your brain retains uh, from your child. That, that is still missing. <laughs> there is no doubt about it. Yeah. Uh, so uh, not sure that. <coughs> so I had one question. Sorry, doctor. Yeah. Uh, so there is one point. So we were talking about almost uh, about the fact that uh, perception as hypothesis. You also mentioned in the paper, and how you are mentioning how hypothesis is different for different people based on your background knowledge, your past experiences, and your expectations. You are bound to make a choice. The paper talks about how domain knowledge is very crucial to get to that hypothesis, which I'm thinking is singular. But as a person, we all have varied hypothesis to the same situation, right? Just like you said. So how is this different possibilities captured uh, in this kind of framework? So uh, if you uh, look at this architecture, the uh, I haven't done a, uh, um, uh, I haven't done adequate job of putting uh, explicitly the human into this picture. Okay. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, and, and you come, um, I have talked about it, but I had to create this architecture that is practical and explainable at that point of time. Okay. So, uh, uh, I'm not talking about emotions. I'm not talking about you know your humans' own choices and personalities, mm -hmm. right? Right. Uh, and and so that part, I talked about serving the human needs adequately, but I have not made human as a part of this here adequately. And that's simply a practical limitation to you know extent in that in a 10 page article, there's only so much you can possibly do. And otherwise, what happens is that as a, a reviewer, a computer scientist reading it says, You are talking about all these things and everything in concrete. Mm -hmm. So, this thing is very cohesive. And for that time, it is very advanced. To, by the way, you should be very uh, clear about the time frame of this. You say 2010 mm -hmm. 11, that's not a good answer. So you write the paper, paper, you should be good. Paper, it says 2010 from research gate. I think it came out, or some somewhere it's 2011. So. Obviously, yeah. paper, what you, I mean, that uh, the paper where well, there is, it says in the bottom what the time it is. Okay, and, and you you also have that video, mm -hmm. uh, you know, that I uh, talk that I, you know, uh, I get yeah, UIUC, right? Yeah. Uh, the um, uh, you see. You're talking at, at, at there are two different communities, even that time, at that time. They were semantic the community, they knew about ontologies or, or something like that, and they knew about metadata and they knew about annotation. They never worked, they also did not do too much work with uh, multimodal modalities. I started, I had a project called InfoHannes, which was uh, you know, images and text and software code. And then I had a project called Visualizeness, which had images and other things. I had uh, then video anywhere, which had video in that. And then I had uh, also a project called Metadata um, uh, Info Quilt. So, pair, you know, you have imagine essentially media of all the uh, 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 all variety in the space and connected through uh, semantic links. So there was information patch quilt. There was a nice very if you do Google on Info Quilt, there's a nice visualization you get. It basically, uh, you know, the, uh, what is this uh, magic? Uh, uh, the magic uh, carpet. Magic oh, carpet, yes. Yeah. And, and the carpet was made for, you know, different component skills, which are all different uh, types mm -hmm. of media objects. Mm -hmm. You know, so, uh, so I did, uh, compared to many other things, I was very, uh, I, I actually had a book also on uh, multimedia uh, in 1995, which went out of print. Um, uh, and 
So, uh, but but you see, my audience involves people who did text. My audience who uh, involves people who did uh, description logic and uh, metadata and uh, you know, and out and uh, RDF. And my audience involves people who did multimedia. My audience who did search and all of those different things. So trying to bring all of them together, this was all I could do in a in a singular architecture. Mm -hmm. I would have liked to, but I did not um, uh, bring in um, the human element as part of it. Even today, if you step back, uh, yet another, you know, we, we, we talk about a number of things that we could do in this group that others are not doing as much. So even today, uh, you know, we talk about multimedia, we have projects on multimedia and multimodal data, uh, but other thing that is of huge potential value is to uh, incorporate the human individual personalization. We have personalized knowledge graph concept kind of thing, but we have not taken it farther, farther, farther. So if you look at competing for human experience, how I, this paper doesn't do all the, um, you know, uh, uh, what you call uh, ser service that you put down to the human and to the experience. Yeah, Dr. Shit, to that effect, we have tried to come up with a new example in which we could um, see how CHE could be implemented in today's day using I mean, the. Most interested, fantastic. Yes. So, uh, and thanks, Vishal, for opening up the topic on perception as a hypothesis. I think Ranjit can go on with his uh, slides. He can move forward from there. So, um, so, uh, so these were the influential works, and oh. then uh, we have four key enablers which. Uh, which gets us to human computer experience. And so one first one was discussed by Chaturanki and the second is elevating abstraction that machine understands. So uh, in, uh, in, in this, the main topic is perception and hypothesis. So uh, in Richard Gregory, in his book in 1966, uh, mm -hmm. he talks about perception as a hypothesis over observation. Mm -hmm. So what does, that means so as far as i understand perception is a passive it's not a passive process it's a very active process uh, it's a very dynamic process as well so um, like let's say uh, we hear uh, a honk so from here so we we kind of hypothesize from in our mind that oh there is honk so it must be there must be a car over there so we hypothesize that fact in our mind and then uh, we use other sensory uh, experiences like vision, for example, and then we either confirm it or we reject the idea. So, so in that way, perception is a very active and a very dynamic process. So, one of the questions that I had while I was looking into this is the fact that how, uh, like, is is it how is perception any different from feeding a large amount of data? Like, why can't we like feed an enormous amount of data and still get perception so so uh, yeah, yeah to answer that question when you are saying the statement from gregory i mean that statement is very powerful right so active information should be there current language models it's one shot text and you are trying to expect an answer mm -hmm. maybe chat gpt has multiple responses but leaving that aside let's say we built as you said with enormous data a model that can predict sound okay from what is the sound coming from and there is birds, this and so on. And let's say there is a firecracker bursting nearby during some event. And we as humans suddenly he hear a, a thud. And first we think about it and then we classify it as safe or unsafe and then see that it's just a firework and just go on about doing our work. Mm -hmm. But if there is. That, um each student line will be all differently and how if we take the chat GP example. I have the same point connecting to on. So see, uh, debiasing AI yeah, is a good topic. There are a lot of papers. Okay. So from the same given example, there is the same input will give different outputs. Mm -hmm. right? different. So basically it's our personality, right? right? We have right. different belief system, we have different backgrounds, etc. But probably we don't want AI to do that. Because we mm -hmm. kill the device, we, we devise it. Device, right. Okay, so if we want really that, mm -hmm. then we have to let AI draw its own personality. Mm -hmm. We can't kill, you know, 
it, it, it's his own personality. So then it's a trade-off. What do you want from here? So then we have to be very clear what you want from here. Then you can't devise it. But if we want a uh, computing for human experience, then don't you think we should... Well, I don't know. I have no confidence. But uh -huh. it's, it's a point I just made. Uh -huh. Probably. So if, if the objective is for a computing system to help enhance, enable human experience, then it would be a good Basically idea for... Slave. Yes. Basically a slave to humanity. Yes. That is fine. So for that, you don't want it to yes. have any sort of personality right. biases. Right. If you want to model a machine to think like a human, act like a human, mimic a human, then you would probably want to have a personality and the biases that come with that but then the question comes how is it how is it <laughs> how to control whose personality is it going to change <laughs> no, no, how to control uh, different people to right yeah. okay. and yeah. i think that is a very dangerous territory to explore it, it is probably not a good idea to put it so but, you don't want to mimic human you you don't want the computer to personally be like a human. personally speaking i I am quite scared of, of doing that. I mean, um, okay, I, I have a very good example of that robot movie. Mm -hmm. I don't. If you go, like, if you if you have watched that movie, you can see that. Uh, I have a good example. Yeah. Mm -hmm. it's, a, it's a story about a, about a robot who wanted water. Mm -hmm. Because she, I mean, it, it was allowed with her. And, you know, she already accepted it, it is water. Uh, this topic, I think talks about computing for human experience. So I think here we want yeah. to just yeah. 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 say, say it. So um, I agree on uh, on these points that whether we want uh, uh, you know computers to understand uh, or uh, act like humans or should we want it as slaves. But at the same time, if we talk about personalization, anything personalization requires some kind of just yeah, yeah. personal but the best movie part. Uh, yes. Right. Yeah. Uh, the man is in a lousy. Yeah. Virtual assistant. So, Megra and uh, Vishal, can you just uh, high level uh, give yes, the overview, right. and then we can move to that uh, final diagram. Can you notice a couple of things, so teacher? This um, uh, notice. Uh, which, uh, yeah. No, uh, me. Just notice uh, what we are. Nobody is left. Actually. Uh, you know, you guys have you know, highlighted the hypothesis. We will take care of the perception. Yeah. Just notice in those days. What were the supposedly current systems or building efforts going on, and what were future? Those were not there yet when we wrote this article. Which ones? The current systems building, the IoT smart home, future, 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 oh, the future ones. Those were, uh, you know, yeah. okay. I, I don't yes. even think I, IoT was at that scale when this paper came out. Well, it was uh, there a scale, no, but in the paper, you have written about internal processing. Like yeah. the Smart home parts and everything smart started in. Yeah, hmm. not. But now, but now, smart energy systems is is the. Hmm. Yeah, this this futuristic view sort of fits more my model of of what you guys should be yeah. focusing on as as a slave to human needs. Yes, in, in yeah. that case, it has come. <laughs> so they are they're chosen especially to serve human needs. Yeah. You know you. Serving you. Yeah. Right. That's okay. So, uh, so, can you go? You, you'll do the next slide. Yeah. Okay. So, I'll just quickly go through this. Um, in, in fact, actually, I'm excited to talk about the example that we have. So, I'll quickly go through this. Now, as humans, we understand through perception and communicate through symbol or language or whatever. And to that effect, even our brain model consists of the two hemispheres, and this we have ex extensively discussed in our uh, class and meetings. That but right. Just important point. The first thing has evolved when these guys talked about completely, you know, uh, uh, the semantic cognitive perceptual. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So that has evolved from, you know, from this time. Right. Really. Right. Absolutely. So the right side is perception based, and the left side is logic based. So. The systems these days are pretty good at the log at handling the logic based part, but the perception based part, I believe, is still somewhat of a challenge. Um, the next point is that it, it just supports that uh, you know we we are not 
it is not sufficient just to have structural syntactic data, but also we would like to have some some idea of human experience, perception, emotion, intent, so on and so forth. Um, and the idea to bring this into computing models would probably be processing sensory inputs to symbolic representation as a bridge. And uh, one way to do so is probably bring together pattern recognition, image understanding, sentiment, intent, etc. Now, here I would like to say that it is not enough to just have these different sensory inputs come together as separate parts, but uh, they need to work in coordination with one another. Right? Because, for example, the um, the point that Vishal made, right? If if we hear a firecracker outside, we we whatever we are doing, we immediately have that sensory input coming in. And we take our next action on the basis of that. Um, the point that Dr. Shalin had uh, taken of uh, what, what if a tiger just suddenly pops up uh, in front of us and what do we do next? So, so the point is that it is a very stat it is a very dynamically changing uh, environment that we live in and on on the basis of which we take our decisions. If we want to model such, uh, if you want to model a machine that is able to take perception into consideration, then these different sensory inputs need to be working together in coordination with one another and not just as separate uh, and individual components. We can move on to the so next I'll slide. just add one quick uh, point out there. So what uh, Megha just mentioned about uh, this perception and uh, these different inputs working together, that brings to how we human work. We learn from everything. So a child is more prone to fall down while walking than an adult because we have learned from those experiences. And as an adult, we learn some more experience that will uh, possibly uh, help us avoid multiple things at later stages of our life. So this entails the whole idea of uh, yeah. lifelong learning, no, 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 no. which is important. Uh, so, so one thing, uh, so uh, I, uh, piggybacking to your point, uh, so we have perception, and why is it very hard for uh, machines to have that, you know, uh, perception and hypothesis? And uh, uh, it is because of the fact that machines don't have the capability of generalization uh, and contextualization. It doesn't have uh, like our real world always comes up with ambiguities and uncertainties all the time. Like like you said, like it always comes up with something uncertain. But machines cannot uh, do that. Be it's uncertain. Very dynamic. Yeah, it's I, very think, dynamic. I think I have an answer to that question. I mean, I have thought about this and hence I have come up with something on my own. But I, I would like you to support or refute this with your arguments. The reason is that the machines today they take one input and they give you one output. Okay. Whether it is a language model, it will take language as an input and it will give you some linguistic output. Uh, I am not exactly correct today. The VLM models, the vision language models do take uh, multiple inputs, but that is also not enough, right? It is not just vision and language together that we take as an output. Multi comes. Mm. Exactly. That, and not just multimodality, there are a lot of other sensory inputs also that need to come into place. So multimodal basically, it doesn't restrict itself to text, vision, language, speech. Modalities could be n number of- Could be a lot. There are a lot of sensory feelings that we have uh, going on around us. Uh, point number three. Okay, so according to report, uh, they did not reveal that completely. Being used to get 1% traffic, right? According to the Microsoft mm -hmm. new, new release, press yeah. release, they got 20% high. Yep. So basically, yeah, if you count that way, so they are now getting the 20% traffic of the internet. Mm -hmm. So this is not true now, and it might not remain true in the future. And now they are, you know, incorporating GPT in all their, you know, tools, okay. like, you know, Word, Excel, and so on. Yeah, so true. the point I already made, you know, the you know, count. I'm sure that feature uh, that, uh, you know, Eric Horowitz, so mm -hmm. I think that yes. Uh, yes, yes, yes. So th that looks very impressive. The examples they give, I don't know how they work in average situation because they can only script some good examples mm -hmm. and show them. Mm -hmm. But planning, let's say, an event and the thing comes up with all those options. That's a pretty uh, substantial thing. In fact, uh, Vishal, you should look at, you know, have they actually incorporated some planning algorithm there? 
because there is a event planning that shows up step by step issues come up. So process, you know, information comes up. So I, I was surprised to see that. Uh, yeah. Was it one of a type uh, kind of thing, or was it just generalized? That's Even hotel booking. Expedia included ChatGPT. So kind of. they took a lot of wiki how instruction structure among other process workflows, mm -hmm. and that went to Instruct GPT as well. They already had a data set for Instruct GPT. They just enlarged it even more. Now what is this? They took a lot of wiki how information, right? We've been talking about, and I've been talking about, and some others, but using existing large oh. human collective generated knowledge. Wiki, how it's just like that, right? Yeah. So we've been advocating use of broad variety of knowledge all the time. In the diagram that I had for the natural language understanding, right? Multiple abstraction. That is one of my major roadblock right now because most of the reviewers consider that as planning because it is planning a task. But planning as it is in the literature, automated planning is a bit different. There are much more preconditions that are prior uh, defined prior, uh, and you need to uh like what do we uh, like we need to respect them and then generate a plan which is not the case here i'll, I'll share with you a historical lesson um this is similar to owl versus idea mm -hmm. owl and this description logic is rigid but you know very concrete it can model constraints and uh you know preconditions post conditions it, uh, it talks about consistency of knowledge right Knowledge graph and IDF don't, but which one gets used, right? So uh, you know more the condition you have mm. for purity and completeness and comprehensiveness and all that, the harder it is to and harder it is to uh, computerize because of all the machinery it takes for that, and then hence harder it is to scale, and hence. It substantially limits the energy usage. So I, I, you know, sure, sure. So uh, the last, yeah, yeah, the uh, yeah, that's right. The last section is uh, talking about uh, CHE at scale. Uh, so the paper talks about two things: how semantic web and semantic computing is very much necessary in order to uh, propel uh, the entire CHE framework that has been described. And that there is another uh, one sentence in the paper that I have my own restrictions on, uh, which is that there is a lot of data available online, uh, which is unbiased, uh, which we, which at least I disagree with because there, I think most of the data that is available is biased, uh, and we need to select the quality few out of it. Uh, and my ideas after reading, uh, like the adoption, why has the adoption been? not seen in the current applications that we have even though the architecture itself or the framework that was proposed itself is very uh, useful uh, it's very novel maybe it is another such idea which was taken away by the neural network wave uh, that was my thought because the overall system itself is much more useful for the human it's much more ex explainable than what we have currently so it just makes sense to have Worked on that and improving that and building better scalable solutions for that. So, what mission here do you mean by scalable? Scalable is, uh, yeah. So, the point which Dr. Seth was men mentioning in today's uh, discussion, the morning discussion, would the current technology of knowledge graph help or ontology help retrieve or search through a billion data pages and give you the result that you want? So, uh, run a query on Google search. Mm -hmm. And you see that number that comes right. How many millions of pages they build? Mm -hmm. uh, run in a language modeling tool. Okay. You, uh, all your uh, computer will crash. On your, uh, Not exactly. Website. Not exactly. Yeah, but so I'm, I'm trying to say that uh, that model of scale doesn't make sense. A graph query today or a database query is hundred times more uh, is faster than language model. So what kind of scale? Are you uh, no, I'm. I'm not talking about language model scale. I'm just talking, I mean, leaving language models aside. At, that is not my area of discussion at all. I'm just saying, why is the CHE framework that we have talked about in detail now is we are not seeing in the web search itself. So now I'm just curious what kind of scalable are you talking about? What is the meaning of scalable? 
So I believe the scale which you are referring to is more to do with the language model. And the one he is talking about is the RDF scale. If that is okay. about that framework to implement for uh, the so you're wave. saying uh, how easy it is to build and uh, operationalize um, right is operationalize the definition of yeah scale, not speed or anything not speed right. or anything at least first have an adoptable solution maybe then we can talk once it's implemented and people are using then comes the problem of speed right speeding up that yeah, that's i never understood scalability when people say you can search through more things mm -hmm. faster scalable in, in terms of i think implementation right what is the question you can't search faster using a neural network than you can you, you can't yeah, you can. Okay, Today, right. okay, so the neural networks are not more scalable. They're not faster in okay. search. Yeah. Just want to make sure I got the knots in the right place. <laughs> but the scalability that you're referring to is faster computation during inference. That is not scalable as yeah. well, right? Yeah. I mean, that does not define the term scalable. Scalable is just expanding to a lot of things, right? Uh, Sorry. Maybe your user base is one thing that we can measure scalability upon. So scalable uh, right now, I guess what we're talking about is what Dr. Has referred to earlier, this ubiquitous computing idea. You can get, operationalize these systems without too much effort at the, at, uh, at scale, right? That's what that I think about the scalability that you are talking about, we have live examples, at GPT, which is scalable in my eyes. And when you talk about inference time, I mean, that's more to do with speed and time. So that is quite different from the scale, right? Which are the different parameters to consider. It's, it's just, um, uh, you take um, businesses today and uh, what their uh, infrastructure is made of. They yeah. care about scalability in the sense that how fast can this service can go to the exam. Right? They so, care about exactly. how many customers can this serve at any point in time. And Jack GPT is nowhere near the current infrastructure. Every company is still using XGPT, right? And then uh, after that, every company is still putting investment in building their enterprise knowledge graph and running graph. They're still doing that. Jack GPT is a marketing gimmick. Mm -hmm. So uh, what kind of... Are you... I mean, are you really sure? Because they have the entire plugin system that is being used by a lot of corporates, right? My understanding is just that. Uh, I mean, yeah, we will continue this discussion later. But for now, uh, this is one example that we thought of where we can uh, try and bring computing for human experience. We use personalized education as uh, a domain. And so, so basically, from our understanding, our discussion, there are three components, right? So we want uh, perceptions to be perceptions to be identified from different sensors. We want models that are that work as. Okay, again, don't take me wrong. Okay, okay but you know, so I checking have been a very fascinating topic. I personally attended two mm -hmm. you know international conference on I checking. Used to be a very big forum, 2012-13. I published paper. Mm -hmm. I personally work on I checking, and nowadays even you can do I checking mm -hmm. for mobile. Mm -hmm. It's a fascinating idea, but it doesn't work. Nobody uses it. Nobody uses it today. It's fine. That's fine. We have an interesting idea, but nobody uses it today. Yeah, but it is Absolutely. an interesting idea, and okay. we can put it to use. Okay. The technology may or may not work today, but it, no, it works. Uh, Perfectly works. It, it is just. <laughs> but people don't buy it. No, today it works. This, but there are systems. This is just a prototype for what we thought of as you know. Yeah, just we can, it. Yeah, we can have these sensory inputs. <laughs> we can, you know. So the idea was that was a good job. <laughs> we are facing, facing difficulty in some some uh, subject. Okay, so we we would we would like to uh, monitor some of the sensors. Maybe we would we want to do eyeball tracking of you know whether it is reading the book, whether it is writing, whether it is doing some hands-on physical practical experiments. We want to see the stability of their hand movements. We want to see their facial expressions, whether they're feeling angry, confused, happy, satisfied, or... So these are our sensory inputs that connect our perception uh, idea. We feed that into learners, and learners can be different models. We, uh, they can do performance evaluation, 
on after doing the performance evaluation, the learners will be able to identify what topics the student is specifically having difficulty in understanding. And after doing so, they can recommend which learning method can be used uh, for that particular student for that particular subject. So these, these can be uh, some of our learning models. And finally, we have uh, our knowledge graph and Hillini's work. Basically, we got the idea from Hillini's work that analogy can be used for this idea that, okay, if this student is facing uh, difficulty in understanding a biological concept, but is comparatively strong enough in chemistry, then maybe the knowledge graph can help the student get an analogy from the chemistry subject to help them understand this biological concept. Then adaptive learning is basically where, you know, the ontology is able to give them some more guided understanding towards that particular topic and maybe give them a personalized curriculum for that particular topic. So this, this was our uh, small <laughs> idea. It's not in place, it's not implemented yet. We don't even know whether it can be, but for now, for the first, okay, first yeah. run, it sounded uh, like maybe you can do something. And, uh, no, it's, 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 no it, it sounds interesting. Um, uh, you are, you know, you are a student, and um, uh, that so far as you frame it um, as meeting that need, keeping the learner in the in the center, and the technology, you know, uh, works around to get that objective met. Then I think you are, um, uh, you know, creating something. Is the computing framework for improving the experience here in this case, learning education. And um, uh, you know, we had the uh, uh, Valerie in our proposal, the <coughs> proposal, we had similar, right? At, at a certain level. Mm -hmm. 